CSN Sports Wrap. My name is Brian Fulford, and joining me right there, or that way, is my man A.D. Drew. A.D., how you doing, buddy? What's going on, Dr. B? How's it going, man? Man, man everything is everything. It's uh, it's great. Um, trying to keep my mental sanity about me every day that that we have. That's about that's about as best as I can say it. Hey, I, I, I got you, man. You know. You know, ever since uh, these states have reopened up, seems like people have relaxed their uh, corona protocols and people have gotten a little bit lazy and, you know, things are getting a little scary out here as far as this coronavirus has got, you know, but we'll get into that a little bit later on in the, uh, in the show. Do you realize we are over maybe right at about the 100 day mark since, quote unquote, team sports ended? I, I, I like to think of, March 12th as the date that sports ended in 2020 we're just over the 100 day mark yeah well I saw ESPN this week I think it was either Wednesday or Thursday they actually did a a I don't want to say a special but a, a segment on the 100 days since sports has ended so yes you are correct we're about at 102 103 uh right now as, far as of this as, recording uh, right as of, yeah as of this recording uh, as far as sports is uh, gone and it, brian you know you and i have grown up as a uh, sports buffs and if they can you have, could you have imagined going 100 days without watching anything live on espn or abc or cbs or Anything. I mean, some of us are already tough enough because let's think about it right now. About two weeks ago, we should have ended the uh, NHL finals. This week, the NBA finals should have ended. We should have already had the running of the Triple Crown in horse racing, for those of you all who like horse racing. The, we should be looking forward to the baseball all-star game coming up in the next couple of weeks and their final push on who's going to be the uh, the starter for the respective leagues. And we should be talking about, are we getting ready to get any of our HBCU players in the NBA draft, which would normally occur next week. So it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's weird. It, it, it's totally weird. And, you know, the only thing that seems like it's going – close to normal is people are starting to plan media days for football and some workouts and things like that. And I say close to normal because the workouts aren't normal, but you still had the planning going on for it and the excitement building around the ever-changing college football season. What I've been amazed by is the ability of other countries to resume sports and team sports. Baseball in Korea, Thailand, now Japan, I believe. Soccer in, let me see oh, if I, I get it right. Soccer in Germany. Soccer now picking up in Spain. Soccer in Italy, England. I mean, other countries are picking up their team sports. Now, uh, I don't think, we haven't seen basketball in other countries pick up, but I mean, when you, I mean, foot, football, uh, football overseas, soccer, as we like to call it, is still a close contact sport. You know, now maybe, you know, people have a lot of concerns about basketball and football, but I would say American soccer, football. soccer is not, 
soccer is not a distant sport. I mean, matter of fact, I was just watching a match over in Germany and England, and you got guys running into each other. Uh, trust me, there have been some scuffles, guys getting each other's faces. So now all the while, the players obviously on the field aren't wearing masks, but you're doing social distancing on the sidelines, you know, coaches, other bench players, no fans in the stands. And it's amazing that those countries are able to put their protocols in place and be so far ahead. And they ended, I got to think, they all ended. We all ended about the same time. I mean, I think the leagues overseas ended a, a, around early March, the same time as some of our leagues here in America did. Yeah, I think everything pretty much ended within like a two-week time span. Worldwide. Right. So so it, 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 it is amazing to me to see other countries – get their protocols going and for a country that loves its sports for a country that thrives off its sports i mean we yeah we, there are 40 million people unemployed or somewhere in that ballpark i mean that's that's tragic when you really think of it um we haven't been able to put it together with our team sports i mean props you know there are other there's sports you know golf uh and, and other sports that have been able to sort of get themselves functioning us ufc yeah, yeah, but, you know, in terms of the ultimate team sports, baseball going through labor contract issues, basketball uh, hasn't, I mean, even though they have a date in mind, you, you really have to question and wonder whether that is realistically going to happen. So, and we're, we're in the off season of when college sports, so, but it does affect the planning, everything that's going on now especially when you hear people talk about the wave and there's conflicting reports as to whether you think we are out of the first wave, still in the first wave, when's the second wave going to start? Those are the kind of things which, again, I said it last time we were together, man, God bless the administrators who are making some tough decisions. And we're going to talk about some of those. And I think a lot of them are going to have to start just really dealing from a place of truth and honesty and get off the fence because there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of indecisiveness and there are a lot of, there's a lot of either or scenarios, which I respect, I respect. But at the same time, if you go ahead and make a decision with protective care and measure, you can move forward and make adjustments. But I think the longer administrators, schools, athletic departments, organizations, the longer you stay on the fence, the longer you, you miss out on your opportunity. I mean, look at baseball, for example. If baseball would have come together, baseball could have been playing in late June, early July. But they sat around. They didn't come together. They didn't get a plan out in place. And what do you know? They still haven't started. And now they're in a the process got, of trying to start. And now you've got, you got millionaires fight with billionaires. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll get into uh, more of the college level things as it relates to what's going on as it affects our HBCUs. I want to remind you if you're watching can, our show. Uh, before you do that, can, can I throw something out on what you just said before you get into the, it, it, into the business end of our uh, conversation? Fire away. Brian. The reason why you're seeing sports being played overseas and not in the United States because of the freedoms that we have in the United States, those freedoms are hurting us right now because we as a society do not have the discipline to follow the rules that have been set forth by the, excuse me, the recommendations that have been set forth by organizations such as the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control. You know, those other countries stay at home, wear a mask, do, do ABC. And those countries did those things for a six to eight week period. And the cases of coronavirus in those countries, some of them have almost gone down to as close to zero as you can get. Whereas in the United States, because we do not have that discipline, people are going outside without the bands, people are fussing about the shutdowns because of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. 
we have rebelled against those recommendations and intentionally rebelled against those recommendations, which has put us in the position that we are, but we have more cases, it seems like in the United States, than the rest of the world combined. Now you can get to the business end of our show. Well said. That's A.D. Drew. You can follow him on Twitter at BCSN Drew is where you can find him. You can find me on Twitter at DRB365. Of course, I want to remind you, follow the Black College Sports Network on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by using uh, or searching for us at MyBCSN1. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and like to the Jericho Broadcast Network's channel there which of course you can always find at my JBN online. That's where you can find us on Twitter. And I also got to announce for you, uh, if you're watching this show uh, this past Juneteenth, which was Friday, uh, July 19th, uh, the Jericho Broadcast Networks relaunched V108, The Vibe, our digital radio stations. And those are up and running now. And we have three different stations uh, the uh, JBN V108 Gospel, V108 Talk, and V108 Urban. And V108 The Vibe, you can find those three different websites. You can go to myjbn.com slash gospel, myjbn.com slash talk, and myjbn.com slash urban. And I'll tell you, AD, I, I've had the Urban channel on running on my laptop for like the past 24 hours. And I forgot how much I love the station. So it's good to kind of have the station back. And we'll be yes. doing some more uh, promoting of that. I was just talking to Roy, uh, Roy Evans, uh, our, the our uh, CEO. director, our CEO, Jericho Broadcast Networks, just talking to him earlier before we recorded this and was was telling him, you know, how much I, I miss and miss the stations and everything. And so that that that's a it's a cool thing and so i want to encourage you to check out all that we have going on you know brian while you had it up on the laptop i actually had it had it on my phone on, on the my jbn slash my bcsn app and instead of listening to my spotify in, in, uh, in my car that i listen to a lot of times when i'm uh especially when i'm out of market or when I don't listen to some of the uh, other syndicated uh, radio shows out there, I listen to Spotify a lot. Now, I, I just I just clicked on the my JBN slash my BCSN app and clicked on the Urban Channel V one hundred eight Urban, and you, you're right, it, it it is uh it is refreshing, and if that's not enough, we also have. Our archive podcast that you and I have done, some of our other uh, sister podcasts, such as uh, Doctor Gravier's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab, some of the uh, some of the games we've done, and a lot of variety, such as the Brunch Bunch. Uh, 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 what's the nerd show called? Uh, <laughs> Grump. Well, it uh, used to be. It used to, yeah. It used to be uh, the Grumpy Nerds. I, I'm not really sure yeah, that show is still nerds. still as it is, yeah. but I think the archives are there. D yeah. DVP, uh, DVP show, and, 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 and pretty much if you need, if you're looking for anything with a black or an urban flavor, we probably have some type of podcast that's going to fit your desires. I'm sorry, I uh, had to add my two cents here to the advertising book. Okay, the, the, the plug portion of the show has been it's brought over. to you by V108 <laughs> The Vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and the my BCSN slash my JBN app. Well said. Wait, all right. Good job. Hey, yeah, high five. Virtual high five, AD. Yeah. Uh, let me see. That way. Yeah. There you go. Fist bump. Fist bump. Fist bump. There you go. All right. Good job. <laughs> right, good job. <laughs> hey, um, I did one of the stories that has broken over the past few days, uh, over the past 48 hours of us recording this, which we really didn't think we'd be talking about. But again, the conference expansion or the news regarding conference expansion has taken off earlier again. in the again right earlier in the week we finally heard and i'll start backwards from earlier in the week ad because i think it's kind of interesting 
we finally heard from MEAP Commissioner Dr. Dennis Thomas. He was on a podcast uh, last week called uh, The Block Sports Show uh, with Michael Jefferson. And it was Michael Jefferson, um, Eric Moore, of course, from uh, ownitin.com, our own Dr. Kenyatta Cavill from inside the HBCU Sports Lab. And I believe Luke Williams ended up joining that podcast as well. Yes, he did. Yeah, so they actually had a conversation. Well, actually, Mr. Jefferson led the conversation, and they finally had the, for, I guess you'd almost call these the first official words from Commissioner Thomas. And there is an article by Luke Williams on the Black College Sports page, which just uh, recently came out, his uh, BCSP for the week of June 16th through the 22nd. And I'm going to just read a couple of the more interesting quotes that I that I came to as we were reading, as, as this came out, as I was watching a podcast. And I, and I think a lot of people who, well, I guess, let me start back for a second. One of the first things that I learned and I didn't know, which I learned through this podcast, is that Dr. Thomas, or maybe this was a different podcast, actually, I think, let me actually know, I'm giving this credit to Ken Rashad of uh, HBCU uh, Sports, because I heard him on another show talking about this. Dr. Thomas actually was one of the main uh, creators of the Celebration Bowl. And of course, you know, for anyone who that, that was on uh, Rob, That was on Rob Calloway's show. Right, the HBCU um, uh, report. And so Dr. Thomas, a standout All-American at Alcorn State, went on to later become the athletic director at Hampton University in the late 90s, early 2000s, when they were really in there. I mean, that was right about the move when Hampton moved from the CIAA to the MEAC. And then he became the uh, MEAC commissioner in 2002. And, you know, he has been, uh, the MEAC has been a, a, a strong conference. I mean, you know, it, relatively speaking, over his tenure. So it's not until more recently where we have seen sort of the departures of Hampton, Savannah State, and jump in here if I forget somebody, A.D. Hampton, Savannah State. Uh, then, of course, the news about North Carolina A&T. Uh, and then, of course, Florida A&M. So that's four. Don't forget, the, don't forget the failed move from the CIAA to the BIAC of Winston-Salem also. Yeah, there's a – you know what? There's a great article that Steve Gaither wrote about that, which – I, that that was some interesting information. I, I don't know. I think you put it in our pre-show notes, but I would encourage anybody to go take a peek at that on HBCU Game Day and check out the history a little bit on Winston-Salem and that move and how that move, um, which at the time everyone thought was going to happen, all of a sudden didn't happen. And it really turned out to be a positive for Winston-Salem and so, yeah, it was one of those things where the MEAC was right on the verge of becoming a 12, I think it would have had 12 teams, if I'm not mistaken. That would have, had that would have been number 12 uh, for football. Well, number 12 would have had 10 for football, which would have allowed them to split to a north and the south. If that would have occurred, we may not be seeing what we're seeing currently in the MEAC. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I don't know if I guess you could call that the first domino, given when it happened, but it, but even when they didn't join, you still had several years of sort of peace and acrimony amongst the MEAC, although they never were able to sort of bring in that twelfth member or that twelfth member from Division Two decided to come up, and then all of a sudden you saw the exodus. But back to the back to the article by uh, Lute. Uh, from the commissioner, contrary to, uh, here's uh, Commissioner Dennis Thomas, quote, contrary to popular belief in some circles, the MEAC's demise has been greatly exaggerated. Um, he went on to later say, all of our presidents and chancellors are concerned, but we also have a great group of presidents and chancellors that are veteran leaders on their individual campuses. 
we have implemented a strategy in terms of how we move forward as a conference. Part of that strategy is to ensure that we have a core group of institutions to ensure that we will not lose our Division I status. And of course, just so you know, to maintain D1 standing, conferences have to have seven institutions that have been a part of the conference for eight consecutive seasons, years, excuse me, and offer the right mix of sports. And I think another thing, AD, he, he made, he made, a, he made a, a point to mention that when the MEAC first started in 1970, that they started with just seven schools from Delaware to South Carolina. I think that's, I was trying to find the exact reference point that he made in that. But but essentially, you know, the MEAC started with seven schools. So, you know, if you, if you look at it and say, from his perspective, I thought it was a great opening conversation from him. Uh, here's, I found a quote here. Quote, some people forget, given this microwave mentality in our society, we were founded with seven members from Dover, Delaware to Orangeburg, South Carolina. And that's the league uh, which was founded in 1970. And here we are, of course, this season coming up on the 50th year of the MEAC. So AD, as you hear some of those quotes from Commissioner Thomas, now again, prior to news that broke at the end of the week, what are you hearing? What are your thoughts as you heard from uh, Dr. Thomas for the first time? Toward the company line, as a commissioner, I expected him to give the positive spin on everything that's happening uh, to the conference and uh, remaining professional. You know, you don't expect him to say goodbye, good riddance. We didn't really want you anyway to Florida A&M and to North Carolina A&T. Of course not. He's he, he's going to he's going to bring out the positives that those schools did while they were in their conference, wish them luck, and try to regroup. And that's what you expect in a public statement. Something else, and I cannot find the reference to it right now, uh, Brian. One thing that I, I saw is that uh, the president of Howard, he, he is working with Dr. Thomas and leading a committee on looking at the future of the conference and what the conference can do. Howard is one of the schools that the conference needs to make sure that they sure up and take care of in order for the long-term viability of the conference. You know, uh, before we get into the, the, the later portion of the week, there are, two, there are two schools that this conference cannot afford to lose. Howard, Norfolk. One of those two schools go, and this is in addition to all the grumblings about possible Bethune, Central, and South Carolina State. But those two schools in particular, Howard, because of the uh, historical prestige and the academics that Howard brings to the conference, Norfolk, because of the size and the competitiveness of the conference and the geographic location of the conference, those are two schools that this conference really cannot afford to lose. They can't afford to lose anybody in that northern, uh, that northern cluster, as I call it. That being uh, Howard, Norfolk, Maryland, Eastern Shore, Coppin State, Morgan State, and, uh, and Delaware State. Those six schools being that northern cluster. They've got to keep that northern cluster together first and make them happy. And, and as they try to do their best to focus on what we need to do to keep South Carolina State and North Carolina Central and, and Bethune in the conference also. But that, that, that sixth Northern cluster is the core, is the key for, for this conference to survive long term. I think part of the reason why the MEAC and Dr. Thomas are getting beat up, so to speak, right now through whether it be message boards, fans, media, is a little bit All related. Right, a little bit related to the fact that you don't hear anything specific. And I think that's disappointing to people when we see all that's going on. I mean, you have, for example, put out different scenarios. Our friend Brian Simpkins 
has thoughts and put out scenarios. That's all happened over the past two months, right? What we haven't seen, I, I, I look at it in contrast to when we talked to Dr. Charles McClellan of the SWAC on the news of FAMU coming over. He dropped little hints about things in his long range vision that sort of made you excited about the future. And the key point I remember him talking, he mentioned about the SWAC being an FBS conference. We don't know when that will be. This happened before George Floyd's murder, before the Black Lives Movement, before America wanted to invest in Black. All of those things now, you know, where sponsors and advertisers and companies want to get behind HBCUs and Black businesses and organizations, now it's like, that might become a reality. I mean, obviously we have this big hurdle of COVID-19, but that little hint about the long range plan and future can whet the appetite of potential investors. And if X, Y, and Z falls into place, he has a plan, he dropped a little nugget out there and now all of a sudden the world is salivating. The MIAC has released two different statements regarding COVID-19 and things of that nature. None of it has any specifics. None of it, it, it just, it feels like real vanilla statements. I mean, it doesn't, there's no plan. There's no, I mean, it just, for lack of a better word, it's a, it's a vanilla statement. And so. What, I was going to say, what, I, what I've seen, the difference between the two conferences is, it seems like the, everything from the SWAC even though McClellan has this leadership style where he lets the schools do what they want to do and lead how they feel is best for them, everything still seems to be coming top down in, in the SWAC. The ideas still seem to be coming top down. Whereas in the MEAC, it's every man for themselves and what we see you, we see you. You know, it's more bottled up and everybody is making independent decisions. And the movement of Hampton, Savannah State, a and and FAM over the last three years has kind of put everybody into the every man for himself mentality. You know, it's, it's almost like some, somebody shooting a gun in the air and you got to start running and you got to worry about yourself first before you try to help your friend. That's, uh, it's almost, it's almost like that. You got to go and hide first and then, now once, I, once I've got myself hidden behind uh, a barrier, now I'm supposed to pull you in to help you out also and see if I can get you out of harm. That's what the media act seems like to me. Yeah, well, like I said, it's just uh, our opinion. I mean, who knows? We could be wrong, but. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I. We're not the only, put it like this, we're not the only ones with that thought. Just saying. Let's, uh, so moving forward, the news that comes out maybe a day or two after uh, Dr. Thomas and that interview, or really after the article comes out from Luke Williams, because I don't think very many people saw the podcast. I actually had to dig for it and found it. I sent it to you. I don't know if you saw, you saw the link. Yeah, yes, I did. And, and Luke's article usually comes out on Tuesday. Yeah, so that a frame of a reference as far as timeline. Yeah, so he dropped that on the BCSP. And so then a couple days later, then we started hearing about this. Matter of fact, on Thursday night, that Bethune Cookman University's Board of Trustees held an emergency meeting, and the topic of its athletic conference affiliation was discussed, including the possibility of leaving the MIAC. QV dum dum dum. And uh, <laughs> so sources, now I'm reading right here, obviously we heard this, uh, did not report what our sources were telling us, but HBCU Game Day did, so I'm kind of reading right out of their report, which, you know, as they like to say in journalism, we can confirm there's what they reported, because <laughs> we, heard, we heard the same thing, who knows, we might be talking to the, the same people who were talking to them <laughs> might have been talking to us, who knows, I'm just saying. But anyway, right. we can confirm. <laughs> but we, we, didn't, we didn't break said. it. We didn't break it because we didn't no. have that second confirmation 
that you need in order to break be, break stories. Oh, I damn a second. Look, if two, <laughs> if I, I, if three people come up with all the same rumor, I'm where there's smoke, there's fire. I'm just saying. So <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm, yeah, three independent people. So. Yeah, uh, part of their report, sources indicated that the SWAC, as well as other conferences, were in the discussion as Bethune-Cookman considers its future. We've long talked about the thought that with Florida a and moving, where would Bethune-Cookman go? Would the SWAC want uh, – we, we always talked about who would be the first choice for the SWAC. I think we both kind of agreed it's Tennessee State would be the first choice, but it'd be hard to look past Bethune-Cookman. Now, having that 12th team does sort of balance out the East and the West. It helps you put, you know, six teams on each side of the division, five on each side, and three non-conference. You can definitely, obviously, the longest trip from Daytona Beach to Texas um, is something to consider. I think also should be noted, A.D., but Thune Cookman has really built up a nice sort of back and forth with some SWAC schools over the last couple seasons, in particular Mississippi Valley State, uh, who I know they have played a home and home series with. Uh, I, I know they, I feel like they played some other SWAC schools, but they, they've I had some they SWAC played, teams. Did they play Alcorn recently? Mm. And I know in baseball they've played Alabama State. Yeah, well, it's it, yeah. So it seems like yeah, you're probably right on that one. I, I'm not really sure about the Alcorn State, but it seems like Bethune has really has really stretched to go into the SWAC territory with their travel. And of course, remember the SWAC uh, or Bethune Cookman is a private institution, not a public institution. Which would like be the Florida first and one in the SWAC. Correct. Good point. So just to reiterate a quote which we've heard Dr. McClellan say, the SWAC is not seeking expansion, but if the opportunity comes along and they fit what we're looking for, obviously we'll take a look. In other words, what Dr. McClellan is saying is, our door is open, let's talk. That's Brian, I'm not just to ask you out on the date, but if we happen to be at the same place at the same time for lunch, yeah, I'll pay for it. <laughs> well said well said i you know that's not that's not bad I have to try that one you, you used to use that one back in the day ad i have to try that one i have to, I have to see if that works <laughs> and I, and I for some reason the me and mrs jones uh, song just came into my head when i was making that reference <laughs> but uh but seriously and i i will throw this out does the swag stop at 12 brian well let me get number 12 but fun, it's funny you asked that. Before we go to that, I, I just wanted to finish up a little bit with what some of the conversation is that the trustees at Bethune-Cookman are wrestling with because there is the option, or I guess what was discussed is the option of considering the Atlantic Sun Conference, which I think you and Brian both pointed out that the conference doesn't sponsor football. However, two of its members, Kennesaw State and North Alabama, are part of the Big South Conference, who, by the way, has what? Already has Hampton, will have North Carolina a and as full members. And so that particular could be an option where Bethune-Cookman could play its non-football sports in the A-Sun and then potentially be in the Big South for football, where they already are currently used to that travel and maybe don't have to go as far. They don't have to go as far as uh, Delaware and the Upper Northeast. So and for for the Big South, Kennesaw State is a critical school because we all know there are no Division Ones in the state of Georgia. And when I say Division One, Division One HBCU. But the fact that you have a Kennesaw State that will be bringing three to four HBCUs, where we're just going to say two a year because of the schedule, that can bring two HBCUs per year into Atlanta, the hotbed of HBCU alumni chapters, to play football. Good move by the Big South if they can, if they can add a Bethune in, in addition to the other schools that they have 
already in the uh, HBCU wide. It's a talk about increase in attendance. Yeah, so so that's that's the big thing, you know, and you, you just mentioned about, you know, the SWAC being at 12. If if they accept Bethune Cookman or if Bethune Cookman decides to if the other SWAC commission or presidents and Dr. McClellan, if they're all on the same page and say, let's bring Bethune Cookman in as the 12th member, that sets up the interesting what's next, because of course, Tennessee State is still out there as the golden goose that may come. And that, then that gives you 13. It gives you 13. And then it starts to bring up the interesting do you go for a 14th? Is there another HBC you, you could pluck? Where would you pluck them from? Different scenarios of that nature. Uh, we've heard some things which I, I kind of hear them and I'm like, that's interesting. The SWAC, although would be in Florida, they would not be in Georgia. Uh, and I think we've all kind of tossed some different scenarios about what school from Georgia, no, what schools, but whoever none it is. Division, none of the Division twos in Georgia are going to move up. Not of them yeah, I was going to say, that's the, that's the big thing. That's yeah. that's the big thing. Is there a Division two school that really is in a financial situation to move up? So it may take some time to be 12 for the SWAC. And the SWAC may say, let's be 12 for a while and let's make 12 work. Let's financially get ourselves recovered from this COVID-19 year before we go for bigger fish and bigger expansion you know that that's a thought so it, it, you know that's a that's what was your what was your initial thought ad when you heard about the bethune cookman trustees meeting uh number one the, the i was kind of perplexed because we found out about this and most people in the media found out about this meeting post meeting meaning that no one knew this meeting was going to occur but we found out about this meeting afterwards now somebody somebody had to leak this information out that this meeting had occurred and these were the things that were discussed in that meeting somebody was wanted that, somebody wanted this information was that, out was was that intentional yeah, yes, it was intentional. Oh, yeah. But, I, what, what, but, but the question is, what was the purpose of the intent? Obviously, it's to put Bethune in the best situation as possible. Because here's the thing. Bethune, before July 1, has to make a decision. They don't make that decision by July 1. They're stuck in the B Act of 22. No, 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 no doubt about that. So now we put that out there that we may possibly be looking. A hey, son, what's your best offer? B yeah. Act, what's your best offer? Big South, what's your best offer? Uh, uh, Southern Conference, come holler at us. Because the Southern Conference is another one that people should look at because it makes geographical sense to consider this, the Southern Conference if you're Bethune Cookman. The one thing that I like that came out of this was they are not going to the SIAC. They are not going down since they've got their financial house in order. They're not looking to go down. So that that's crucial. So now you start looking at the Division One conferences, which conference is going to put them in the best situation. Now, Bethune to the SWAC. Do you realize when Bethune comes to the SWAC, they will own, the, when I say they, the SWAC, we're pretty much on all of the major HBCU football classics. Uh, let's see. Yep, that, let's outside, see. Mag outside Magic outside City. Aggie, well, let's see. Aggie you got. What? But but is that? Hey, let, let, let's talk. Okay, when we say classics, let's talk about neutral site classics. Let, let's not talk about home games disguised as classics. Okay. So. Bayou. Bayou. Magic so, City. What? Magic City and, 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 and the Florida Classic. The Florida three, Classic. The three, la the three largest in attendance year in, year out. Those are one, two, three. And, and if I they're do. able to get the Golden Goose of Tennessee State, they would get the Southern Heritage Classic. 
which which is which is all all of the stuff that I had this class. Which is I a top five. Which is a top five. I mean, that's easily within the top five, depending upon the year. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, let's let's think, think about the bands. I, I'm, 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 I know I'm jumping in here on you, but think about the bands. Uh, the the level of, we we heard Dr. McClellan. I mean, just think about what you can do with that with that band event that you could possibly have. I mean, that just in itself becomes even a bigger deal as you have pretty much the premier bands. I mean, with all respect to the bands of the of the uh, SIAC and the CIAA and the MIAC, the baddest bands would then be all housed in the 12, the SWAC 12, right? Right. Yeah. And, and a couple of the classics, uh, and now this is one of those ones disguised as a home game, but the Labor Day classic between Alabama State and Tuskegee. V v v v good, good attendance. At, at that classic, you know, you talk about putting yourself in a position with advertising dollars. The SWAC has already led in attendance 42 of the last 43 years, Brian. You bring all those classics within the same conference. Talk about the money that you could command for advertising, Brian. It's, it's going to be second to none. If you're looking for the black market, which is a trend now. Exactly. That's the trend. Well, we're, we're, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the course of the next uh, 10 days or so, as you mentioned that July one date. And of course uh, you, you mentioned this, that Bethune Cookman being a private institution, nobody knew about this trustees meeting because they don't have to make it public, which, you know, unlike the situation with Florida A&M, when they had their trustees meeting, they had to put all their information out. And that's why all of a sudden people were aware of what was going on days before the actual trustees meeting and this one popped up on, on on the radar because it was you know as a private institution you don't have to announce these kind of things but but trust me it it came out almost immediately after that meeting happened so i agree with you somebody wanted it to get out and i i think they wanted this to be known to alumni I think they wanted their alumni base to know and hear it and say, look, we're, we're what? working, we're working to find the best place for us because we have a good brand. I mean, again, Bethune Cookman over the past decade, the second winningest program in black college football. And I'm talking by a thin margin behind North Carolina a and I mean, we're talking maybe a game or two in terms of wins and win percentage. So let's not let's not fake the funk that Bethune Cookman is just some other team. They've had a had a strong decade. We They're not just fan views, uh, Florida Florida Classic. Uh, exactly. Florida. They 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 own the Florida Classic over the past decade. They were had a winning football program. Their band was featured in a Netflix documentary series. So hey, let's not talk about the baseball program, Brian. And look, it's been and the basketball program and, 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 and women's women's, basketball. Hey, it has been a good decade for Bethune Cookman. And I know, you know, look, look they, they're not just Florida AM's uh I'm trying to say Sweet this mate. politically correct. Sweet mate. Sweet mate, thank Sweet you. Mate. Yeah. <laughs> they've had a good they've had a good year. So and I it's just wanna... S U I T E, not S-W, S-U-I-T-E. <laughs> there you go. All right, AD, let's do this. We got to take a break. When we come back from the break, we're going to get into some of the news related to COVID-19 and its effect, not just on college football, but on HBCUs. And comments from one particular head coach really has made me think about what college football might look like in the fall semester if they if people listen to what this coach says uh, a lot of people really have to be shaking their head and saying what are we doing out there we'll come back and tell you a little bit more right after these words you're watching the bcsn sports wrap brian fulford and ad drew we'll be back right after these words
Let's face it, shopping for insurance can be time consuming. That's why when it comes to your auto, home, and life insurance needs, make things simple and trust the experts at Allstate. They will help you get the coverage that fits your needs while helping you bundle your life, home, and auto policies. Bundling saves you money, sure, but it also saves you time so you can enjoy the things that matter most even more. Contact me, Tammy Haynes, your local agent, for a free personalized insurance quote. Allstate, are you in good hands? It was a, a monumental game for a and and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose, and thank God, it was them this time. We knew it was going to be a battle. Look at Jake Avis' record. 202 and 36, I think, some, some un, off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on in, in the East Stands. The whites were sitting in the West Stands. And the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we weren't inferior, that we were not inferior, and we were not afraid. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and A.D. Drew here. want to remind you to follow the Black College Sports Network at MyBCSN1. That's the number one on Instagram, Twitter, and, of course, you can search for us there on Facebook. Of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe to the Jericho Broadcast Networks. That's MyJBN Online. And, of course just recently restarted v108 the vibe our digital radio stations uh not only playing gospel and urban but also a talk network so three different three different networks and you can find them all at myjbn.com slash gospel myjbn.com slash urban and myjbn.com slash talk and that's where you can find v108 the vibe music for music or talk for your uh, listening pleasure so ad i mentioned that a prominent hbcu football coach sent out a very interesting tweet in my opinion and i'm not really sure it's gotten the kind of attention that a a top five level coach uh, deserves or gets. Meaning, if you say, who are the top five coaches in HBCU football? Well, I firmly believe Broderick Fobbs of Grambling would be in that list. Would you agree with me on that? Definitely. Definitely. Definitely in the top five. You know, there, there are a few other names that we could throw in there, but we're not going to throw them out right now because... Well, top five. Okay. I'm just saying. Top, I'm, not ask, I'm not asking you to give me your top five. I'm just saying, yes or no, is he in your top five? Yeah, yeah, he's definitely in the top five. The only thing I'm gonna say with that, probably if we came up with the top five, we probably wind up with about seven to eight and have to cut it down to five. So <laughs> Exactly. Well said. So anyway, I think it's I think most people would would agree with me on this. And and I'm just gonna read his tweet that he sent out Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon this past week. This is from at GSU Coach Fobbs. If we care about these student athletes as people, workouts need to stop. Too many players are receiving positive tests, triple exclamation point. Remember, this is someone's child. Now, that came out on a Thursday afternoon, and I was like, wow. Is anybody reading or hearing this? I'm not, there, there's very little buzz about that. I mean, just imagine if Urban Meyer or I'm, I'm thinking old school names. See, I had Urban Meyer, uh, Mark, uh, uh, Bob Stoops, hell, those Nick guys have all Nick, Nick Saban. Saban. Okay. So yeah, you know, Nick Saban, if Nick Saban tweets out something like that, everybody's buzzing, you know, it, 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 it's the, the, the internet world, but the HBCU media, HBCU marketplace, 
I don't think really either they didn't see it or they just kind of dismissed it. It's his account. It's, it wasn't like it was an unofficial account. But that was heavy. And it came from a place of a, a coach that's seeing things going on in his profession. And it's the first time I've heard a coach really – from a standpoint of a parent or, or really, you know, obviously coaches a lot of times taking, taking this role as being a player's second father or surrogate, or, father. or surrogate father. That's where that felt like it was coming from. I mean, we're starting to see cases where during these, this period of time when players are going back to college campuses, you're seeing players po- test positive for COVID-19. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But just share your thoughts, A.D. Do you feel like this is a big deal or kind of a medium meh deal or no big deal at all, this tweet from uh, Coach Fobbs? It's kind of tough as a parent of a child of children. I understand where he's coming from. I definitely understand where he's coming from. But as a coach, he has such a fine line that he has to walk. You know, his job, he's getting paid X amount of thousands of dollars from Grammy State University to prepare a football team. Say what you want to say about them being student athletes and wanted them to graduate and all that stuff. And yeah, that's important. But when it's all said and done, his job is to produce W's. He has a job to produce wins, to put Grambling football in the best position possible to produce wins. Now, sometimes what you're paid to do and what you're morally obligated to do conflict. This is a prime case, an example of what he's paid to do and how he feeds his family conflicts with what he knows or what he feels that he should do as a man and as a parent. I have the answer. I really have the answer. I understand where he's coming from. I understand the dilemma that he's in. Thank God I am not in the coaching profession right now. How many coaches a year from now or eight months from now or six months from now are going to be fired, released from their contract, and otherwise because of the offseason and the season coming up and you're not able to produce results that were expected uh, from you? Now, I'll say this. If you were on the hot seat coming into this summer, you probably just got one year pass. They were going to get rid of me anyway, just, just being a fact. But if you were not on the hot seat, and now your seat gets a little warm, warmer, you know how you know how when you're driving down the street in your car, you got the seat warm on, and you, you didn't realize that you hit the seat warmer when you was getting in the car. It's on low. It's not on high, but it's on low, and you're like, dang, I got the AC on. Why, why, why is my butt so hot? Oh, you look down, and the seat warmer is on. That's what's going to happen to some of these coaches uh, next year, Brian. And it, 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 it's a bad it's a bad situation that these coaches are being put into. And I'm not just talking about football coaches. Every coach in every sport, because this is how they feed their family. But you have to make decisions that affect men, other families. Because the, the one thing that any of these coaches do not want to have happen is, A, one of these coaches, excuse me, one of these players gets sick and, uh, and, and dies because they made the decision to coach, to coach football and to let this child uh, participate in football. Or even worse, a child who was in your program who gets sent home for COVID or contracts COVID in your program and takes it back to their house and their parent, grandparent, or other significant other 
dies because they were a part of your program, do you want that on your head, Brian? Yeah, no, no, I definitely don't want that on uh, on my head. And I, I really think it, it really speaks. It's almost, um, I mean, next to, next to Fred McNair, I mean, Coach Fobbs is probably the, the winningest coach, active coach right now in the in the uh, SWAC. Maybe uh, Coach uh, Dawson, Dawson Odoms might be in that one, two range as well. So obviously, Fobbs using his platform and using his position to make a statement. Now, obviously, I don't think any HBCU programs have players – doing workouts right now that I'm aware of, not like what we're seeing from power five programs. So, but, but those days are upcoming as it's already been put out there by the uh, division one council, the opportunity to work out is available to everybody. Um, I believe there are dates in July that some schools are planning to have players back and it's a concern, and I, I would I would wonder, I really wonder how that tweet went across from the leaders at Grambling State Athletic Department, President. Maybe they're already thinking that, but, you know, I haven't heard anything like that, and especially from the SWAC offices. You know, when, when you, again, just picture the equivalent of – Nick Saban, or maybe who you might who might you say is the second most prominent coach in the SEC? In the SEC, uh, I'll maybe. just say Gus. Gus, Gus. Okay, yeah, Gus or, or Jimbo. Even Kirby, I mean, Smart. Uh, Kirby Smart. Kirby Smart. Jimbo. Yeah, I'm at, yeah. Kirby Smart might be. A, you know, if Kirby Smart sends that tweet out. What's that going over? How's that going over in in the conference within the conference and other coaches? You know, we, we're seeing a lot of coaches come together and talk about a lot of things and showing their unity and solidarity for their players. But to my knowledge, I don't see anybody almost pointing a finger and yelling at these coaches and saying, hey, look, you guys need to stop these workouts. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying. It's like because you guys that's are, how they have to feed their family. You guys are you guys are messing this up. And, you know, I mentioned this earlier. I don't know. I can't recall whether we did it on air or off air talked about, but one of the things that, that uh, was brought up, you don't hear a lot of parents. There's no parent voice that you're hearing talking about the safety concerns for their players or for their sons. You know, how soon do we start hearing that? Given some of the cases that we're going to talk about here, how soon do we start hearing from parents? that are saying, I don't, I'm not a big, I mean, we're hearing players speak up, but again, we understand that parents speak volumes. And if they, if they raise enough, you know, hell, they can help get a help get their kid transferred or recruited or unrecruited. <laughs> I, I got to imagine there's going to be a parent or two with some thoughts on this. So uh, we'll kind of stay, stay, stay alert and see, over the course of the next week, if there's anything more that comes out from Coach Fobbs, uh, we, you know, I know we, I, I, I sent a request to him and to the football office, and, and maybe we'll get a chance to have a conversation with him to find out where his thoughts were, or you know, maybe what his thoughts are still regarding uh, the comments that was made. Can I uh, put a closing thought to that, Brian? Yeah, so we can move forward. Yeah. Uh, Broderick Fobbs could say that and get away with it because of the number of years he has at Grambling and the uh, uh, the clout and the uh, I guess uh, I guess the equity and built up capital it's that he true. has in, in the Grambling program. Could a second year head coach have said the same thing? No, I don't. I don't think they. I don't think they would have. I don't think they would have. And that's that's a good point. That that's why that's why I maintain that was such a such a strong statement made. And and and, and brought that Fobbs is probably saying what a lot of other coaches are thinking 
and either do not have the stature or the relationship with their university to be able to put out a public statement like that. Or you, you know these coaches talk. They, they may have said, hey, you the one with all the clout. Please, please say this for us. This is what we're thinking. I can't say it, but you can get away with saying it. I can't. Yeah, it, it, it yeah, is I'm definitely out there. no. It is definitely against the pop. It, it's against the actions that we're currently seeing taking place by college football programs. I'll say it like that. Now, another thing that we have noticed, Ad, related to COVID nineteen, we've seen already its impact, and four HBCU games have already been canceled. Uh, two of them, two of them are classics in in well known uh, well known places. I mean, obviously, we have the Detroit Classic, which was set to feature Southern and Tennessee State. We had the Southern Heritage Classic, which was supposed to feature Tennessee State and Jackson State. Then we had a game between, I believe, Jackson State and Langston that had to be canceled. Then we've also had the Southern Florida A&M game, which is supposed to be held at Southern, uh, be canceled. So if I'm, if I'm doing the math here, Jackson State, that's two games canceled. Southern, two games canceled. Correct? Yeah. Correct. <laughs> so... Those are, the, that's, those all, are the, that's, that's on the Division One level. We're not even going to talk about the Division Two and, and the IA schools that have uh, canceled games. Right. Far. Yeah, and, and they've been they've been forced to kind of basically lose what would be their opening games of the season, if I'm not mistaken. They they lost on. Um, Western State lost the game. Well, uh, yeah, they they lost the the opening non. I think it's the September fifth weekend yes the September which would have game. been the opening game for a lot of them and I think the Winston-Salem game was primarily affected because of the Mountain East right they've gone with a conference only schedule and they play a large conference schedule anyway where really they, all their they conference play members conference games. yeah all their conference members only really have an opportunity to play one non-conference game and for I think it was UNC Pembroke they were scheduled to play Winston-Salem State, so they lost that game. West Virginia State lost a game. Obviously, West Virginia State is in that Mountain East Conference, and they right. lost. A Morehouse, Morehouse lost a game versus uh, Edward Waters. Right. Morehouse lost a game with Edward Waters. So, you know, that's just uh, – Edward Waters' Memorial game has been rescheduled. Luckily, they had, both had a date at the end of the season, so they – uh, rescheduled that classic. Yeah, so the the uh, NCAA Division One Council, they pretty much allowed all the athletes in sports to begin participating on voluntary athletics beginning June 1. Uh, that's at, especially on the power of five level is what we've seen. We haven't really seen this be affected at the HBC level, but what we have seen, and we started talking about this last week on the last show where uh, the, the cases that happened at Houston for the University of Houston, there were so, there were six, and six seems like a small number when I get into some of these other schools, which have popped up with more numbers. But with just six cases at Houston, they shut down workouts. They stopped having workouts after six. We've seen thirteen happen, uh, and this is an article that came out just the other day from uh, InsideHigherEd.com. The, the numbers over the past week, and this is the reported of tested positive to COVID-19. We've got 13 at the University of Texas, eight athletes, although it's, uh, it's likely that they're football players at Kansas State, eight at the University of Alabama. We first heard about those a couple weeks ago, three at Oklahoma State, a couple at Clemson, which is now blown up to about 20-something. As of the other day, we've seen about 21 football players at Clemson University test positive, and I think it's a larger number in in terms of staff and other athletes. I, I saw reports in the 40s. Uh, total. Wow, wow, 40s. I mean, imagine yes. 
40. Uh, up, up to 23 football players. Yeah. Um, we've seen a couple of, I mean, a, a couple other schools on this list have uh, listed just a few, but it just brings, you know, we, we, again, in sort of talking about Coach Fobb's tweet, we've seen this number grow. And you brought up a, before I get into one of the quotes in this article from uh, Dr. Fauci, you brought up an interesting thought about are we look you know but uh, i guess the thought was people may be looking at these numbers and what we're seeing in a certain way but maybe maybe just maybe they need to think of it in a different way if, if what was your point on that i'll let you explain your 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 thought on what we're seeing as it relates to these covid-19 positive tests we're probably talking combined 50 to 60 athletes between all these schools thus far. Correct, Brian? Sounds well, about right. Yeah. These athletes had COVID, whether they were at home with Mama and them, or whether they're at so-and-so state university. They had they had COVID. They came down, they came to school with COVID. Okay. And I think this was part of the reason why the NCAA put with this six-week uh, protocol. Let's get them in. Let's see who has this. Let's go ahead and get them tested and treated because these people probably would not have been tested in their hometown because all of these people are probably asymptomatic, asymptomatic, excuse me. So let's get them in. Let's get them treated. Let's get, let's, let's get them, let's get them good again. Now, two, three weeks later, they're clear. We have, we assume that we keep them isolated from the rest of the team. We should be free of COVID in our quote unquote bubble. Now, this is what you need to look out for. Let's look at the numbers mid July with this same group of kids who are on campus now. See if those numbers increase. If these numbers are increasing, who's breaking curfew? Who's out doing what they're not supposed to do? Because if everybody's in the bubble and everybody's staying in, going from dorm to practice to whatever, your, your numbers should not increase because you're self-isolated. Everybody is self-isolated in that bubble. That's number one. So let's look at the numbers in mid-July, a week or two after the 4th of July. Then let's look at what happens to the numbers when the general population of students come back to campus. Let's see if those numbers increase then. Then we can figure out what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do with football, what we're gonna do with everything else, and how these numbers are affected. Those are gonna be the two things that we need to look at. And our HBCUs will need to keep this in, in account as they start to bring back their athletes. They they need to have prepared that we need to bring these athletes back in enough time so that we can quarantine them for a two-week period, two to three-week period, while those who are sick get well, but we still have enough athletes working out where we can put in our offense, where we can put in our defense and get prepared for the for that opening day, September 5th or September 12th, whatever that whatever day that is. So HBCUs keep that in mind as you make your plan. And and I think it's been talked about the fact that you have to be you have to be mindful of testing. So that's the big concern when we when we talk about how are HBCU schools and programs going to get back up and going? Because obviously you have to have enough resources to have testing and consistent testing. Uh, look at this quote here by Dr. Fauci, who recently had some concerns as the numbers are starting to come out about football. And he said, quote, unless players are essentially in a bubble, insulated from the community, and they are tested nearly every day. Think about that for a second. Tested nearly every day. That's a lot of tests. It would be very hard to see how football is able to be played this fall. If there is a second wave, which is certainly a possibility and which would be complicated by the predictable flu season, football may not happen this year. Now, Dr. Fauci says that. And then, of course, you get everybody from President Trump 
to anybody who's anti-Fauci or anti-COVID-19, uh, that it's a hoax or it's some 5G related scam or something. All of those people jump out of the woodworks and like, no, 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 you can't do this to football. But, but these, these positive tests, and then you, you see in certain states, look at other sports, what's happening in other sports. Baseball's trying to come back and they've had three different teams report of positive COVID testing in their spring training facilities to the point where they shut down those facilities. And here's baseball talking about potentially trying to come back in August, right? And But they've got teams where they're testing positive. You've got upticks in positive tests happening not only in Florida, but in Arizona, other places like that. You've got concerns from other programs, hell, uh, UCLA, UCLA football players. Uh, the report that I read from the LA Times uh, was about 30 or so players had submitted a petition to the university requesting a third party health official for all team activities. And I guess the players wanted some sort of whistleblower, uh, whistleblower protection because I guess they felt uh, the program might not have their best interest in mind. All of that's happening, AD. All of that is happening around, and I think Dr. McClellan said this, the HBCU market and the HBCU teams, they're on the low. I mean, hell, every small football program that's not a part of the Power Five, you're, you're, you're on the bottom of the food chain. You don't have the mega television deal and almost the – the pressure to get back out on the field like power five programs. I mean, we got people in our community upset about a few damn homecomings being canceled or potentially home canceled. I mean, the hell with it. I mean, really, what are we talking about here? Keep it real. What are we talking about? Are we, do we care about these players? Do we care about uh, the safety of that community? I know we want sports back. Hell, I want it back too, but Man, AD, I, I, I grow my, – my, my comfort, comfortability or the likelihood of football returning drops. It, it was like maybe about here back in March. No, I'm sorry, April. I, I'm saying now it's starting to fall down a little bit here. We, we, you know, I'm, a, I'm almost 50-50 right now. I really am. I'm almost about 50-50. I think I'm 55-45 on whether football will return. I mean, that's where I'm at right you, now. What? You, you look like the presidential polls right now. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and, I, and, and, I, and I come from the standpoint of, I've said for a long time, in order for us to have a season, and the same thing that you see, the NBA, the NHL, uh, everyone who's trying to come back, if you're trying to come back, then you are essentially willing to say – we know that there's going to be some positive tests. We have to be willing to work through that. And yes, it sucks because it may mean people, lot people's lives are in danger. I'm sorry that uh, that has to happen. That uh, got to be able to work through that. Go ahead. Couple, couple of things. A. All all our, our HBCUs are in economic empowerment zones or economically depressed areas, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of our HBCUs are in towns and cities where we're the only show in town, like a Grambling or an Alcorn or a Tuskegee or places like that. So are these tests that these football players and other athletes take it away from uh, the general population of that city? I have a problem with that. Yeah, the, op one. the optics of that. Yeah, the optics of that aren't aren't good. No doubt. Right, number one. Number two. Who's paying for this test? Is this coming out of our athletic budget, which is already slashed, which we're already don't not going to be able to get the revenue back because we're not going to have the fans in the stadium and the homecoming uh, events and the, some of the vendor booths and all that stuff for homecomings. And we've already had classes canceled. So where's, how are these, how are these going to get paid? That's number two. Number three. And 
this just came to be as you and I as we were just talking in your second there, Brian. Will our polls be affected if we play football because of COVID-19? What happens if an Aquarius Glass of Alabama A&M is out two weeks because of COVID-19? What happens yeah. if what happens if a Jermaine Martin of North Carolina A and T is out two weeks because of COVID nineteen? How does that affect the the playoff race? How does hey, that COVID- affect the 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 the, the, the celebration bowl? COVID nineteen you know, becomes things, a little more come, becomes a little more dangerous than uh, than a sprained ankle. Yeah, those are things that you have. Those are things that that have to be that you have to think about. How will these? How will they affect the? Playoff on the Division Two level, how would they affect the seeding for for the regional uh, rankings? Something to think about. And that, even though we don't talk about it a whole lot, I want you to think about this on the Division One level. College football season ends on the Division One level, FBS level, first week in December. First Saturday of December is usually all of the championship games, right? After that, usually. Kids, kids do their finals. They go home. Those who come back, those who have a bowl game, come back a week or 10 days before the bowl game, practice, and participate in their bowl game. Did you just, did you just hear what I just described? Kids go home and come back for, for the bowl game. How's that national championship picture that's played the second Monday in January going to be affected? Look, I, I'm. We're about to go to a break. I'm really looking for. <laughs> I'm looking for. I'm looking to see at what point will we see some leadership within the HBCU community, whether it be presidents, athletic directors, um, lead from the front and make the tough decision. It is an. It is going to be an unpopular decision because like you like you stated earlier we are so accustomed to sort of having things our way and doing things our way and having such so many freedoms and we don't really listen we don't listen to guidelines we hard you know we're hard-headed yeah we don't listen to guidelines very well i mean just go go to the supermarket go to the supermarket and see how many people in the supermarket have on masks to protect someone else who else is thinking of someone else Okay. And so I'm as much as I want sports, again, somebody's gonna have to lead from the front and make yeah, we tough get, call. We get we get paid for doing sports. That's part of what we do. <laughs> you know, that's that's what this show is called, the what rap? The sports rap. We need sports in order to justify this podcast. Yeah. So, so anyway, somebody's going to, somebody's going to have to lead from the front. Somebody's going to have to make a decision. I mean, I applaud North Carolina a and canceling their homecoming when they did, you know, put, put, put that, put that to bed. I'm telling you, know, Winston Salem state canceling homecoming props to the, uh, the administration there for letting people know uh, we understand the, all these extra activities, 50, 60,000 people don't really mix with, uh, social distancing don't really mix with a potential second wave. I don't care how many people mask up. There's still going to be some people who don't. Okay. And it, it, it's just going to be what it's going to be. So I, I applaud them for making a tough call. I, I think every HBCU ought to go ahead and make the announcement here in the next week or two and say, look, let's cancel our homecoming plans. Why are we even, why are we even toying with it? I, I was listening to, a, a webinar with another university and the athletic director was kind of you know he didn't want to he didn't want to he didn't want to be put on the spot about homecoming but he got put on the spot and needless to say although he didn't say it was going to be canceled he did say it'd be different I felt like I could read his face and say he wanted to say that s ain't happening and wanted to cancel it but i mean you can't you can't really say that at that point because it's not official from at, from a university perspective but right. i i'm looking for the next week or two i'm calling a prediction here i'm expecting at least 10 more i'm saying the number will be 10 i'm expecting at least 10 more universities to cancel their homecomings for the fall it just makes sense 
And you know what else we're going to see, Brian? The one thing that you do not like to see, classics designed disguised as home games. You're going to see a lot more of those this year as they move away from the neutral sites this year. Yeah, well, you know, we're not we're not even going to get into the discussion about how you're going to fit fans into stadiums and things of that nature. I know it's a, a classic where you normally pull 40,000 and you put them in a 15,000 uh, seat stadium. Yeah. And, and and you can only have 5,000 of those 15,000 seats uh, for social distancing purposes. Here's your litmus. Here, here's your, here's your, you know, as we talk about spikes in certain states, watch what happens with NASCAR over these next few weeks, because I believe they're about to start letting uh, race events happen with small numbers of people, five, 10,000, I think. I think there's even a, a race upcoming where they're talking about maybe 30,000 people. Watch what happens in those events. That, 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 that event will be what sort of gives football people, administrators, I think that will give them the thumbs up or thumbs down or, you know, they, they will pause depending upon what happens as a result of fan interaction at those events. If you have five to 10,000 people at a NASCAR event outdoors and you come away with very few people that contract COVID, I think people will want to have that number. And when they get to that 30,000 mark and you get a, I mean, you're going to get some, but if you don't have a major outbreak, you know, a la Mardi Gras and what happened in New Orleans, if you don't have something like that happen, you will start to see football come back. But, but God forbid, if there's a, if there's got a break, an idea for, got an idea yeah, for you. Yeah. What, what, you know, these NASCAR places and these horse racing places, you should seat over 100,000 people, correct? Yeah. Most of these, most of these uh, places. Why not take the football to uh, move some of our black college football to to some of these uh, venues if you want to get fans in? You can space them out. You can be socially distant and watch the game. I'm just throwing an idea out there. Somebody needs to take it and at least explore it. I, I remember – an athletic director wanted to do an event like that and was shot down because in, in, Tennessee, in Tennessee, Bristol, Tennessee, I think it was. Yeah. 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 I remember that idea was thrown out there and people shot it down. And, and then of course, uh, Tennessee and George ended up playing a game in that same building. So hmm. needless to say, sometimes we get in our own way, but we're praying, we're praying and we're hopeful because that's what we do. Well, that's what we do well. All right, let's take one more break, AD, and then come back and wrap up the show with some final news and notes. Remember, you're watching the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and AD Drew here. We'll be back right after these words. For my people that don't get to see me, trying to remind you who you are just like in Romans 3. See me about to blow off the world just like a day is breezy. This motivation for the people and this classic Bible teaching say, hey, this for my people that don't get to see me. Trying to remind you who you are just like in Romans 3. See me about to blow across the world just like a day is breezy. This motivation for the people when this classic Bible teaching say, hey, 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 hey. Motivation. Q Time is our classic Atlanta soul food restaurant located in the historic West End. Q Time Soul Food is a family business started by Fred and Christine Crenshaw. Come on in, relax, and sink your chops into our tantalizing, mouth-watering, distinctive soul food with a twist, the Q Time way. 1120 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard, or call your order in at 404-758-2881. Do you miss your mama's cooking? Then come on down to Q Time, an Urban Passport member. Now you can live in Texas and not have a good red meat blend. Texas Cowboy Dust is designed for steak and other red meats. It's out to be my most popular spice blend, made with onions, peppers, ground mushrooms, pink salt, and other spices. Texas Cowboy Dust also goes great with chicken, pork, vegetables, and has a restaurant quality sheen to gravies and sauces. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kever's voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. 
Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, KeversVoice.com. Always on, all the time. Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and A.D. Drew here with a final segment, some news and notes. I want to remind you to uh, follow us on social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, and Facebook at MyBCSN1, the number one. That's where you can locate us. Uh, in terms of following A.D. on Twitter, at BCSN Drew, and you can find me at DRB365. Of course, want to remind you, Make sure to like and subscribe to whether it be our Facebook pages or our YouTube page, the Jericho Broadcast Network's YouTube page, My JBN Online. That's where a lot of our uh, shows get uploaded to. And of course, want to remind you: make sure you check out D108, the Vibe, our uh, digital radio stations, playing the best in urban gospel and talk. We have three different channels that you can that you can. Uh, plug or log on to from your computer uh, myjbn.com slash urban myjbn.com slash gospel and myjbn slash talk and of course you can even listen by downloading the jbn app on uh, apple or on the google play store just search my jbn or my bcsn and that's where you can find the app and so whether you're rolling around like ad was earlier <coughs> you can <laughs> you can log on and listen to the stations there or if you're at work or need something to listen to around the house while you're working you can tune into the stations there all right ab news and notes time what's your first news and notes that you got for us the NCAA extends its policy banning championship events where the Confederate flag is flown. And this comes uh, June 19th uh, via ESPN.com. The NCAA expanded its Confederate flag policy on Friday to prohibit all championship events from being held in the states where the, where the flag is flown. Uh, the NCAA's previous policy, which was enacted in 2001, applied only to predetermined championship sites. At that time, it affected both Mississippi and South Carolina. But in 2015, South Carolina uh, ch basically changed uh, uh, the rules and removed the Confederate flag from its, uh, its state capital. The NCAA policy now includes all championship sites, including those awarded based on competition, like baseball, softball, lacrosse, and women's basketball. Uh, why, 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 why am I bringing this up? Why is this important for our HBCUs? Brian, who has hosted the last two SWAT championship games? Alcorn State. Where is Alcorn located at? Do I need to take this any further? Does that qualify, though, as an NCAA event, though? It is, a, it is an NCAA championship event. It's for the SWAC championship, which is NCAA sanctioned uh, conference. Really? Yes. Huh. I didn't know champ. I didn't know conference championship games applied. I thought they were referring to more and, uh, NCAA uh, uh, the, events. The old rule, the old rule, it did not apply. But I want, let, me, let me read this again. The NCAA policy that includes all championship sites. That's a championship site, including those awarded based on competition, like baseball, softball, lacrosse, and women's basketball. Right now, the, the SWAC, think about how the SWAC hosts this basketball tournament. If you are a Mississippi team, you cannot host the first round like they host on, on, on campus. You cannot host the first round of that tournament on your campus because that is an official, that is a championship event. I, to me, to me, AD, that still doesn't read 
like championship games apply. I mean, I, I you know, I, I heard what you read. But, 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 the, but the tournaments are championship events. But conference tournament events, not NCAA. See, I, I and I, who knows? I, I, I'm, I'll admit if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. NCAA, when I think of these, I'm, I'm thinking NCAA like tournament, you know, once you get past your conference and you have regionals or first, second, right, excuse me, sanctioned first, second round events, regionals. That's what I thought we were talking about. Uh, and, and I give you one like this. Uh, Southern Miss is slated to host the 2022 uh, Conference USA Conference Baseball Tournament. So, this inc- from what I'm picking up from this article, this does include conference tournaments. Okay. I'm going to dig a little more for that but to find out a little we, bit more because i haven't seen well because when that statement came out did we read did you okay i was gonna say because we haven't read anything from the swack yeah. in regards to it was almost that a news statement <laughs> the good old friday news dump that's what it, was. Gotta that's love what it. it almost was gotta love it gotta love it uh okay moving on to speaking of the state of mississippi For the first time in the history of these two state universities, there will actually be a football game played between the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss, and Alcorn State, the Alcorn State Braves. Uh, This contract was recently put together between Alcorn's Director of Athletics, Derek Horn, and Ole Miss Vice Chancellor of Athletics, Keith Carter, uh, in a joint statement It seemed to be, uh, this is, uh, we're excited to be here today to announce our 2028 competition against the University of Mississippi. Our two football powerhouses will participate in a contest that will be the first ever between both institutions. It is, it's so important for schools within the state to compete against each other. And I'm very happy to develop this relationship and opportunity with my dear friend, Keith Carter. We're looking forward to this contest and to other continued opportunities, not only with Ole Miss, but also sister institutions within the state of Mississippi. Obviously, it sounds like there's a nice relationship there between Derek Horn and Keith Carter. And this will be the first ever game between the two teams and will also be Ole Miss's first game against an HBCU opponent, any HBCU opponent. I, and that's that's interesting. Now, this comes on the heels. Oh, so the, uh, real quick, the game is scheduled for September 9th, 2028. This comes on the heels of the announcement last, maybe about three weeks ago, that in the state of Louisiana, LSU is scheduled – its first ever meetings against Grambling State and Southern University. Southern, of course, is in the same city of Baton Rouge with LSU. And those games, I believe, are scheduled for 2022 and 2023. Don't get me to trying to guess which one is first. Uh, I I don't know. I I think, I don't even, again, not going to guess. One of them is in 2022, one of them's in 2023. But again, those games are played at Tiger Stadium in LSU. And again, historic measures, the first opportunity that those schools will get a chance to play each other. And so that's pretty significant. I just found it interesting. Excuse me. I found it interesting that this game won't take place until 2028 AD, which is eight years away. Probably, probably n- none of the coaches who are only staff will be you there were, in 2028. You, you, were, you were too eager to throw that out there. See, I was going to be a little <laughs> more subtle. You were just way too eager to throw that out there. The, hell, the athletic directors may not be there at that point, but I just thought it was pretty cool that Ole Miss can schedule something eight years out. That just tells you – what life is like in the power five where you're setting up a calendar for eight years ahead and you know 
<laughs> I just thought that was like, wow. So, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Now, who's who's left? I mean, when will we finally get the Florida A&M versus Florida State matchup within the state of Florida? When will that finally happen? Who else? How about Clemson versus South Carolina State? Will we ever see that happen, A.D.? Uh, who else? Let me think. What what else can we get? Um, how about Alabama? Have we Alabama? Have we ever seen? We did see. Didn't Auburn and Alabama State Auburn play? Auburn and Alabama State played, and Alabama A and M played Auburn also uh, a few years ha, ago. Have either of them played Alabama? Not to my knowledge. Okay, so there there's another matchup we haven't seen. Uh, I'm trying to think. Tennessee, Where else? Tennessee State. Yeah, Tennessee. I mean, I know Tennessee State plays Vanderbilt. They're in each other's backyard. That game was almost an upset a couple years ago. Remember that? Tennessee State almost won that game. Yeah. Uh, actually had a lead, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, Vanderbilt, though, I don't think is a public university, though. I think they are. No, they're private. Are they pri they're private. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. All right, next story, that, AD. That, what you got? That's the only private, that's the only private school in the SEC, by the way. Vanderbilt. Yes. Okay. It's the only private school Good in the point. SEC. All right, next one. Next up. Uh, next up, a couple of baseball signings. First one is going to be uh, Carter Williams from North Carolina Central, just signed a free agent contract with the uh, with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, he'll be in the, here going to the minor league system. Williams is the fifth fifth Eagle to sign a MLB contract. Track. That's either being drafted or signed it as a uh, undrafted free agent since 2015. So uh, kudos to uh, kudos to Mr. Williams. The, they did not announce his uh, how much he, how much he signed for in this uh, particular article. And this article comes off of HBCUSports.com. Uh, Trying to get some, uh, trying to give you some stats. In 157 games, he started 154, batting 329 with a 477 slugging percentage and a 410 on base percentage. Uh, in the top 10 in the MIAC and career uh, career records with doubles at 43 and runs scored with 127 uh, runs. So uh, good luck to uh, to Mr. Williams as he signs a. Uh, a baseball contract with the uh, San Francisco uh, San Francisco Giants, and also this is via Twitter. Uh, no further information than did the tweet that was sent out by Talladega, but uh, if you're the Brian Sierra signed a free agent contract with the Chicago Cubs. This was a, a tweet via the Talladega Athletic website. Uh, Sierra played uh, with Talladega this past. Uh, this past baseball season. So uh, those are a few, uh, few, a few baseball signings that we have, uh, that we've had come across the wire the last uh, week. Right? And we want to encourage people to go check out blackcollegenines.com. I'm sure there's some, some information on these uh, young men on, on that website and any other signings that'll be coming out make sure to check out the uh, blackcollegenines.com, of course, uh, Michael Coker, who we spoke with last week, and uh, Jay Sokol, who's the founder of that uh, site. I'm sure they've got some updated information on those players, and as any other news drops, I'm sure they'll drop that as well, right? Yeah, I hope so. All right, let's, uh, let's go to another news note. So last week, A.D., we, we mentioned that tweet by Jeff Goodman – uh, and I do recall, we did mention this last show, didn't we? The tweet about the an ACC, that he said there was a source that an ACC head coach had mentioned that he wanted to play an HBCU school. That was in last week's show, correct? Do you recall correct. that? Okay. Yes, sir. I, I mentioned that because what's interesting is when I go back and I check the timeline of when the actual tweet it shows a different date. So somehow it got changed. But I do remember seeing it on Sunday when we recorded our last show. So anyway, the tweet from Jeff Goodman, who, who's a basketball insider, analyst. Uh, he's worked for everybody, ESPN, Fox Sports. 
um, currently works with Stadium as their basketball analyst. He dropped that tweet, essentially what I said. And so it kind of left people speculating about what might happen. Hell, I even wrote a blog post with that the thought of what it might take in order for an ACC program, you know, all, all the pros and cons, the merits of an ACC program playing an HBCU, you know, obviously already the power five programs have non-conference games in November and January against a lot of uh, smaller D1 programs, including HBCUs. Those check games are how basketball programs help the athletic department survive throughout the course of the year at any point in time. Any school may be playing, you know, anywhere from five to seven or eight uh, non-conference games against Power Five programs, or at least uh, Division One programs that are willing to pay them to come on the road. So <laughs> take fam, you don't play a home game to a conference. Yeah, sometimes that happens because you got to you got to pay bills. That was part of what was leaving people kind of like, how's this going to work? You mean, really, is an HBCU going to have to go to, you know, said ACC school on MLK Day? That, that doesn't seem right. But then on the flip side, you you know, hey, a lot of the, the Power Five programs or, or any, you know, an ACC school coming to an HBCU, I mean, obviously the stadium's not going to be the same size, but it still might be a unique opportunity television-wise, visually. It might be attractive for the HBCU, maybe you get an incre increase in uh, ticket revenue. Although, who's to say that an HBCU who normally charges 20, 25 bucks for a ticket, I mean, if, if said ACC school, you know, if Duke is coming to North Carolina Central, is North Carolina Central going to jack the ticket prices up three times? You, bet, you best believe they will. I, I don't think they would. I, I, I read a quote from somebody... I, 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 I bet you best, but they would be almost stupid not to. And that's probably going to be the only time when you don't get a general admission ticket. You will have a sit in row 13, section M, seat 15. So you, you, AD, if AD were in charge, he would jack the prices up three if times. AD was the AD, <laughs> we're going to have those. We're going to have premium seating. We're going to have everything else. And we're going to have the alumni club have their own special section too. We go do it just like a football game. You were you were savage. You uh you you got it figured out. I, I hear you, AD. Uh, so I I put together a blog post on my blog site, the Doctor's Inn, and I threw out some different scenarios of some various matchups that made sense or might make sense, you know, and just to kind of just to kind of see what people were thinking and, and I got a I got a few a few eyes that watched it. I mean some of these matchups, just think about some of these matchups, A D, that I proposed. Duke against North Carolina Central, UNC against North Carolina A and T, Florida State against Florida A and M, Miami against Bethune Cookman, Virginia against North They played State. that they, they played in Miami last year. I right. Uh I thought they had played each other before. Virginia Tech uh, against Hampton, Clemson against South Carolina State, and then I put Notre Dame versus Howard. And my my reasoning for that one, I said there'd be two fine institutions, Notre Dame and Howard, two very fine institutions that I think, you know, however that game gets played, the analysts will probably be talking more about the institutions more so than the actual game on the court. Okay? So – that that's pretty much what what I wrote in the blog post. Well, uh, that ACC head coach, you know, according to Goodman's tweet, was going to sort of make that announcement a little bit later in the week. And sure enough, on Thursday, it came out that the ACC program is the University of Notre Dame. And Notre Dame is going to be traveling. Notice I said traveling. To, to Howard Virginia. University, to Howard University for a first basketball game of between Notre Dame and Howard. Uh, that game will be played on Martin Luther King Day, uh, Martin Luther King weekend. That'll be played at Bird Gymnasium on the campus of Howard University. And so what I failed to 
think about as I was putting my scenarios together is the synergy or the relationship between the two coaches. Uh, head coach Mike Bray was an assistant coach at Duke from 1987 to 1995. Well, Howard's head coach, Kenneth Blakeney, was a player for Duke from 92 to 95. So there was already a strong relationship between those two. Goes even deeper than that. Uh, Mike Bray uh, used to coach in the D.C. area. Uh, he was a understudy of the legendary Morgan Wooten at DeMatha Catholic High School. And I'm not sure if Blakeney is from the D.C. area. I, I don't have that. I thought, he played, I thought he played at DeMatha. I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah, well, he didn't play at DeMatha. He played at uh, Death High School in okay. uh, D.C. So... Uh, you know, that's a, that's they're a both from the DC area. That's yeah, they're both from the DC area. So it kind of, it kind of worked as in so many levels there, the relationship between the two. So it just makes sense that Notre Dame is traveling on the road to take on Howard. Um, that game will take place on Martin Luther King day. And, and look, I, I propose that. And I think you even mentioned it last week. It'd be great if, maybe instead of ACC teams playing HBCU games, if you featured on your main networks of ESPN, if they were able to play, you know, AC or uh, CIAA versus SIAC, SWAC versus MEAC, that'd be a great challenge day, an interconference challenge day. But I think you can still do that if you took maybe six to eight teams and then maybe – one or two outside teams. Like, take this Howard and Notre Dame game. Are there any other ACC programs? Because, honestly, outside of the relationships that I mentioned, those were the in-state synergies. I mean, outside of that, I start getting kind of wild with the matchups. I mean, you, I you, – You almost have to look SEC swack for your next yeah, year. You, back yeah, back you know, back you back. almost have to do something like that. So, anyway. Texas A&M versus a Prairie View A&M, for, for example. Uh, Mississippi versus uh, Alcorn or Mississippi State right. versus Florida. Right. Uh, right. D- the two Alabama schools versus Alabama or Auburn. Uh, right. In the context yeah. of this, it just didn't make sense to have too many SWAC schools traveling all the way out to the East Coast. Now, again, if the ACC school – is willing to travel. They have the budget. They can do it. If they're willing to go on the road and travel to an HBCU, that's what, if you're really talking about making this an event, that's what makes it, what makes it work. And so obviously being played in DC, Notre Dame can, can package this in a couple of different ways. I mean, hell, they might even be able to play uh, who's who's in the ACC? Is, Mar- is Maryland still in the ACC? No, Maryland's not in the ACC anymore. So, the somebody, some who's in that area? Somebody's in that area, and I feel like in the DC Virginia, area, Virginia would be the closest. Okay, so say they play a Virginia ACC Tech cool. on a Saturday. You know, they're playing Virginia or Virginia Tech on Saturday. Well, hey, on Monday you turn around and you you go play Howard, and that whole weekend you can take your kids up to uh, D.C. You can go through the Civil Rights Museum. You can go to the MLK. You know, there's a there's a great synergy about going to D.C. on MLK I, weekend. I got one that's better for you in D.C. George Sean Howard. Yeah, Georgetown. Yeah, I get you. Georgetown in the Big East, though. That yes, makes sense. I mean, different conference. Different conference. Uh, that'd be great. I mean, that that it almost makes you think. I, I applaud Notre Dame for and Mike Bray for making it happen. I, I think I read in the article that he's encouraging or trying to see if he can get some other schools to to do something similar. Uh, of course, like I said, the, the ones that the synergies between a Duke and North Carolina Central that are sitting right there in the same uh, Durham North Carolina area that that and that's an easy one that's easy yeah. the same thing for North Carolina traveling to Corbett can you imagine what Corbett Corbett uh, Club Corbett as they call it what that might be like <laughs> if if say a North Carolina or Duke is coming to Club Corbett uh, to play North Carolina a and I mean that would be a special 
uh, environment. And I, I think I would not be surprised. I don't know what the early schedule looks like. I would not be surprised if Duke and North Carolina jump on board. You know, Mike Bray having a relationship with Coach K at Duke. Uh, obviously, he's one of the elder coaches in the ACC, has a relationship, I'm sure, with Roy Williams. I wouldn't be surprised at all if Duke and Carolina said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And it's an easy travel, too. It's not like Notre Dame having to travel from Indiana to D.C. I think it's, a bus. It's, a, it's a bus ride. A bus quick trip. bus ride. Bus trip, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and you play there. So uh, a lot of significant hey, hey, can, can, can you imagine the shock that the camera crazies will be in, to, in for when they go into a North Carolina Central? Yeah, North hey, look. A and I mean, look, you got the you know, you you don't you don't have a DJ in the corner at at uh, Cameron, but <laughs> the, the DJ versus the Cameron crazies. The DJ versus the Cameron crazies. That'd be that'd be an awesome uh, atmosphere to see <laughs> to see. So, uh, well, you know, props to everybody who's making that happen, and we'll have more, I'm sure, if uh, if some other uh, related news comes out of it. What do you got next, AD? Last uh, news bit. Uh, my last one is uh, I just lost my spot here. Give me just a second, Brian. Yeah, well, while, while uh, you're uh, while you're looking, just want to remind people, you know, V108 the vibe, uh, there. three three digital radio networks, uh, V108. Uh, Urban, V108 Gospel, and V108 Talk. Go to myjbn.com slash urban, myjbn.com slash gospel, and myjbn.com slash talk. All right. You got it? All right. Yeah, do some academic notes uh, right now. Alabama State Tennis finished with a team GPA of 3.92, Brian. Brian. That were Sylvester's. Matter of fact, I could count the number of times where I had a 3.92 in a Sylvester. This is a whole team, Brian, with a 3.92 GPA. But uh, take it, look, we're going to take it even further than that, Brian. Alabama State had 14 teams finish with a GPA of 3.0 or better for the uh, for the spring semester, Brian. Think about that. Four point oh in fourteen sports. I believe they only sponsor uh, like sixteen sports, Brian. And fourteen of the sports had a GPA of uh, three point oh or better, including a team high three point nine two for uh, for tennis. And that we're going, to, we're going to, since we're talking about academics, uh, Brian, uh, as, uh, the MEAC uh, also announced the uh, commission's all academic team. I'm not going to go through and uh, and read and read all these uh, players out, but uh, Bethune had 117 who qualified on the all academic team, and to qualify. Uh, Students have had to maintain a 3.0 or better grade point average throughout the academic year. Bethune led the way with 117 athletes. Coppin State had 52. Delaware State had 110. FAMU had 110. Howard, excuse me, Howard led the way with 145 uh, athletes. Maryland Eastern Shore, 86 athletes. Morgan State, 72 athletes. Norfolk State, 84 athletes, a and with 93, Central with 125, South Carolina State with 93 athletes, all on the uh, commissioner's our academic team. So uh, you, can go, you can find the article at uh, bxsports.com for the specific players who were on, who were who were on that academic team from each university, but I just thought I'd throw out the uh, total numbers uh, for you, Brian. Well said. All right, I got I got two SWAC stories in front of me 
but I'm only going to do one of them. So I'm going to give you, you, you get a choice, A or B. You want A story or B story re related to the SWAC. I, I'll, I'll throw it out to you and, and based on and, what and I, and I have no idea what these two stories are. No, I have not told you what they are. A or uh, B, well, come on. Uh, since, since my name begins with an A, we're going to choose A. All right. Your A story uh, comes out of a recent conversation that Commissioner Charles McClellan had with Heather Dinich of ESPN, a, a conversation which uh, I, I just noticed as I'm recording this, uh, Stephen Gaither of uh, HBCU Game Day wanted to remind everybody that, hey, he told us this two weeks ago. But anyway, the, uh, the, the, the story as it's written about the SWAC preparing to start its football season on Labor Day weekend, but the, the SWAC has a contingency plan to begin as late as October 17th or cancel fall sports entirely. And that is if the coronavirus pandemic remains a threat. Remember, Charles McClellan told us back in April that uh, he, he famously told us if we want football in the fall, then we have to be willing to listen to the recommendations from the health experts. Now, I would evaluate our listening abilities over the past couple months as below below average or below expected. I, I don't think we've I don't think America in general has done a great job of listening to the medical experts. We've questioned them, we've defied them, we've scoffed at them, we've done everything but listen. And so as Dr. McClellan said, the alternative is you potentially will not have football in the fall. <laughs> so uh, he did make a point in this article or in this conversation. He said, quote, anything after the third week in October, we have decided that's our drop dead date and that we wouldn't have sports and possibly look at the spring. But of course, the spring would take some NCAA legislation. Um, so the SWAC and MEAC have three more weeks of flexibility in their fall calendars. Uh, because those schools participate in the Celebration Bowl instead of uh, participating in the FCS playoffs. So that's where those three extra weeks come into. Now, it makes you wonder if if you push back, could you potentially be going from – follow me here. Could you potentially go from end of the regular season, SWAC championship game, Celebration Bowl following week. You know, right now, the MEAC has like it's a almost – It's a two-week gap. Well, not for the MEAC. I'm saying the MEAC no, has like almost a three, four-week gap. The SWAC has a two-week gap. The SWAC has a two-week gap. Depending on which team it is, yeah. It, it sometimes and they, and they technically – everybody but uh, – everybody – well, everybody except Alabama State and the Bayou Grand, Classic uh, Bayou have a two-week gap – have a two-week gap between the end of the regular season and the SWAC and championship game. game. So Correct. that's where those extra three weeks come from that, you know, if you push back the season, you can gain some extra momentum there. But, you know, again, we, what we talk about, we talked about conference leadership, letting you know that, hey, we have a plan in place and we're willing to lose the season if by X date things aren't better. So what do you have what do you have happening here when schools are allowed to open up their campuses and they do have players start to come back if they follow the pattern of what we've seen and talked about earlier from other schools there are players who are going to probably test positive how that affects everybody will remain to be will remain uh unknown and and then from there what happens when more students come on campus you know, that'll be the next wave uh, when August happens, when you go into fall camps. So I, I applaud uh, the SWAC, Dr. McClellan, again, being out in front. We'll wait to see whether the MEAC has any sort of uh, contingency plan. It'd be nice to know if the MEAC has some sort of plan like that. Uh, I think maybe we'll hear from them this week. I, 
you know, they're losing the press. Uh, we're going to hear from the media this week. We don't know what we're going to hear about. <laughs> I would I would hope so, man. I mean, man, you can't you can't let the swag just continue to get all this press. I mean, Jesus, everything coming out of swag is positive news. You know, tell me something, Miak. Tell me something. Give me give me some good news. Something. Tell me anything. So that was that was uh that was story A. All right. And I, I won't mention story B because we're short on time. But we will be uh dropping some of these other story bits. Uh, throughout the course of the week. Make sure to listen to the uh, BCS Sports Report that'll be running during the week. If you're listening to V108, The Vibe, whether it be on our Gospel, Urban, or our Talk Networks, you'll be able to hear some of those sports reports coming out uh, during the course of the week. Uh, AD, I'll give you a, a word, final thought here before we get out of here. Aside, um, that's all you got, huh? <laughs> I mean, it, it's. I mean, I've got so many ways that I could throw in my last word, but uh, let's not forget that the coronavirus is out here. Everybody wants to see football. I'm. I am concerned about whether we're going to have sports return. So let's do what we got to do, and let's stop being selfish, and. Do what the experts say. Wear your mask. I know it's uncomfortable. I, I I know it's hot. Trust me, I know it's hot having that mask on while you're outside. You know, and if you don't have AC in your car and you ride with three people, I know it's tough putting put your mask on while you while you have no AC in your car. But wait a minute, so hold on. Do, are you are you are you wearing your mask in your car? Well, if you got if you have people in your car, in theory, you should have your mask on because you're in close quarters. And you know, you know, some some of us, some of us, what well, I do, but, but I do have a vehicle that does not have AC, and uh, the AC does not work in my one of my vehicles. So you have a vehicle but if you're that with your doesn't family, have AC. But if, but if you're with your family, you're not wearing your mask with your family in the car, are you? I have one of my masks around family because I'm around other people in addition to my family. So I don't want to potentially expose them if I if I have if I'm asymptomatic. I don't want to expose them. That's once again, that's not being selfish. And yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's uncomfortable as heck with it's ninety five degrees on, but you got to have all this dog on bass because you because you're doing what you got to do. But I'd rather, I'd rather take a few moments of discomfort versus uh, seeing one of my loved ones catch catch the corona. That's my final thought. Stop being selfish. Well said. Um, I'm looking for some <clears throat> mask. I'm looking for HBCU. Uh, I, now, look, I'm, I want to say officially licensed um, <laughs> mask. But, you know, I, I, of course, I'm a, I'm a FAMU Rattler. But, I, you know, I, on this podcast or wherever, I'll rep, I'll rep another HBCU. And so if you have any any leads on uh, anybody that's out there producing officially licensed <laughs> mask. Thank you. Officially <laughs> licensed. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll even take the unofficial ones, but uh, send me, send me a tweet, send me a tweet at DRB three, six, five. Let me know where I can go to, uh, to get a mask. I'll make sure to uh, wear it for a second on the podcast. I'll share it, you know, give uh, somebody, uh, a plug or two. So if you're listening and watching and you know where we can get an HBCU inspired mask, let me know where, where I can purchase, uh, preferably FAMU, uh, my family, uh, my sister's a Tennessee state graduate. My parents are Norfolk state graduates. So I will wrap those programs institutions first, first, you know, first and foremost, but, but, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm all about the culture, a HBCU love, you know, what, whatever it takes. Um, but I just want to throw that out there. Final thought. And uh, that'll do it for this show. Want to encourage you again, check out V108 The Vibe. That's Jericho Broadcast Network's digital radio stations. Uh, Urban Gospel and Talk Radio is back on the internet. And uh, we've got some good stuff playing all throughout the course of the day, 24 hours, seven days a week. MyJBN.com slash urban. MyJBN.com slash gospel. 
myjbn.com slash talk. And of course, you can find the JBN app on Apple at the Apple iStore or on Google Play. Just search myjbn or mybcsn, and that's where you can find the app for those. All right. For AD Drew, find him on Twitter at BCSN Drew. For me, Brian Fulford at DRB365. Thanks for watching. Encourage you to like, subscribe, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at MyBCSN1. And of course, on YouTube, the MyJBN Online uh, YouTube page is where you can find us. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. As AD said, be safe, think of others, take care of yourselves, and we will see you in the next show. Uh, hello.